Mr. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, Carleton graduates. It is a great privilege to introduce M.G. Vasanji. I suspect that very few of us at this ceremony today can boast of more extraordinary or more various lives. M.G. Vasanji was born in Kenya and raised in Tanzania. He moved to North America to study at MIT and then the University of Pennsylvania, where he earned his PhD in nuclear physics. In 1978, he moved to Canada to take up a postdoctoral fellowship at the Chalk River Nuclear Facility, and then two years later, became a research assistant at the University of Toronto. But with impeccable sense of career prospects, he was in the process of switching his focus from nuclear physics to literature. His first novel, The Gunny Sack, was published in 1989. Since then, he has become one of our most acclaimed authors, having published six novels, two collections of short stories, a memoir of his travels in India, and in case all of these were not enough, a biography of Mordecai Richler. He is the first author ever to win the Giller Prize for Fiction twice. He has been awarded the Governor General's Prize for nonfiction. And in an earlier trip to Ottawa in 2005, he was made a member of the Order of Canada. In his novel, The Book of Secrets, one of the characters reflects on the fact that the colonial diary, which the whole novel circles around, is inherently incomplete. The character says, it is, quote, a book of half-lives, partial truths, conjecture, interpretation, and perhaps even some mistakes. What better homage to the past than to acknowledge it thus, rescue it and recreate it without presumption of judgment and as honestly, though perhaps as incompletely as we know ourselves, as part of the life of which we are all apart. There may be few more eloquent descriptions of the historical imperative and the moral force that distinguishes Dr. Vasanji's own work. This sense of contingency, half-lives, partial truths, conjecture, is especially true of the in-between world, to echo another one of his titles, of the Indian community in Eastern Africa that M.G. Fasanji hails from, caught between the hierarchies of imperial power and the resistance of local nationalist movements. Fasanji's work explores the complexities of this predicament uh, through a series of unflinchingly honest but deeply empathetic accounts of the coming of age, both of individuals and of nations. But these stories are more often marked by an abiding sense of the melancholy of receding horizons than the euphoria of historical arrival. An awareness of the insidious forms of complicity and sometimes the jagged contradictions that haunt this community's location within this life of which we are all a part. In an age when the idea of the nation and realities of migration have become deeply intertwined. Few writers have provided an important and such an important and evocative chronicle of our modernity. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of outstanding contributions to the arts and the promotion of international understanding and discourse, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts honoris causa upon M.G. Visanji. By virtue of my authority, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Mr. Chancellor Charles Xi, 
Madam President and Vice Chancellor Dr. Renta, Dr. Christopher Caruthers of the Board of Governors, members of the faculty, postgraduates of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, families and friends of the graduating class. First and foremost, congratulations to the graduating class. Uh, and it is with deep gratitude that I accept this honor, perhaps also a graduating, one of the graduating class, that I accept this honor from Carlton on behalf of myself and what and where I come from. It's a daunting prospect. What do you tell a graduating class? There are platitudes one can utter. Do what your heart tells you, follow your dream. How simplistic. Your heart may tell you one thing, your circumstance is another. Your heart may tell you to go to your parents' home and <laughs> take your former bedroom. Your parents might think otherwise. <laughs> and it's always so easy to pontificate profoundly about justice, about art and freedom and liberty. Life is not so simple. It has to be lived, and everyone here believes in art and freedom and liberty, so what? There is a presumption to pontificating, especially by one generation to another, and when there's nothing to lose on one side. In a month, you'll forget me. You will not know who I am from Adam. I'll be gone from your lives. The truth is that I don't even have answers to give that I have learned from my own life. What I can tell you perhaps is a bit about myself, an example of a life lived, but hopefully not ended soon. How I have come to see myself. And if you can make yourselves believe, suspend your disbelief, that I was in your place once upon a time. And there was a time. Perhaps there will be some communication. I, can, I confess that first, that most of the time I'm not, not, not completely sure of myself. In case I sound demented by this self-observation, or you ask yourself, who is this Maharishi talking in riddles, some Yoda from Toronto? Let me in my defense point out that some degree of uncertainty is a quality that is required of both the scientist and the artist. Even when an experiment confirms a scientific theory, we all know, questions remain. What exactly has been confirmed? What else is there? And to what accuracy? Every answer raises more questions, or scientists would soon be out of jobs. And people still do try, for, to give you an example, to test Einstein's theories, just in case. If you can just prove him wrong by a tenth decimal place, you could get your Nobel Prize. We don't know everything. To come to my own current specialty, that of a fiction writer, a novelist, few writers, I think, know beforehand how a work will develop, what twists and turns a novel might actually take, how exactly it will end. I once began a novel, and this was in my early phases, knowing exactly what my character was. A bad guy based on a real person whose ethics I found questionable. But by the time I finished that novel, and this is what I'm sure most novelists discover, the character was not so bad after all. And she had taught me a lesson, a lesson in humility. That, after all, is one of the joys of writing, the completely unexpected. One learns in the process of actually doing something. I will give you two illustrative quotes from which I get great satisfaction. You might say that, in a sense, they define me. One is by Eugene O'Neill, the playwright, who said, I was condemned to be one of those who has to see all sides of a question. When you're damned like that, the questions multiply for you until, in the end, it's all questions for you and no answer. The second part of this statement, I should assure you, you are perhaps too young and fresh to appreciate or are required to live by. 
One doesn't expect you to be paralyzed by uncertainties or confusion. That's for someone like me who's seen the certainties disappear. But the first part of the quote I think is crucial. One must see all sides of a question. All sides that are possible anyway. The other quote is by the Polish poet Czesław Miloš. He says, beware the enduring image of the poet. Ill at ease in one place, ill at ease in the other. Always and everywhere, ill at ease. No need to get depressed here either. All that means is don't be stuck in one intellectual place or position. Be loose. To me, these quotes speak of artistic honesty. It's easy, after all, to be fashionable, to say or write what's, what expect, what's expected or what will please, to always raise the flag vigorously, to be more patriotic than the next guy. But it takes some courage to see the other side of a question. But more than that, I think these quotes also say, don't rush to judge. It's easy to judge someone by their faith, their clothes, and as we know now, by their turbans, by their skin color, by their sex. I need not say more. When I think back to when I was your age, full of questions, full of excitement and self-confidence, when life was open-ended and there was so much to achieve, and there was, believe me, such a time, and it was only yesterday, a time when there were so many facets to a question and all the time to think about them. I sometimes recall a decision I made not to accept an offer that could have taken me on a different path. I was offered more or less a place to study applied science at the graduate school of a very prestigious university. And this was only in my third year. I said no. Applied science, it was too dirty. I wanted to be a theoretician in the mode of Einstein or Dirac and all the great scientists that we worshipped. Was I foolish? Did I not know my own limitations? I cannot say. I was not a bad student. Uh, quite a good one, I think. But was that good enough in a tight job market? And now sometimes during the long winters, I look outside at the snow and the ice and muse about that decision. I could be in California. I mean, instead of going outside and perhaps sleeping on the ice, if I'd only first decided not to go to Massachusetts as I did, but somewhere west, there would be flowers in March, sunshine and the sea. But now that I think about it, Toronto is not necessarily worse. I think in some way it's much better. But February, when the months seem to stretch and May seems far off, can bring doubts along about that path not taken. There will always be paths not taken, a book not written, a romance or passion not pursued, a hunch not followed, a field of study or a profession not chosen. Some of the choices are moral, in fact. We live with the guilt or the doubt. Let me give you an example. Where I grew up in Tanzania, a very small percentage of kids could actually get to high school. Places were limited but free. In fact, education was free right up to university. And even your travel and living expenses were paid. We were told, however, during those idealistic times, that a boy or girl who is admitted to high school was like a boy or girl who is given all the water in a village so that he or she can go somewhere and bring water for the entire village. Let's assume there's a drought. This homily had a profound effect on me. It often comes back to me. Standing before you is someone who took the water and then went to get the coke and hamburgers for himself and then ate the french fries and gained weight. And now can visit the opera or a, or a restaurant and what not. I left with that promise to myself that I would return and teach some, the younger people in the place I came from. I did not. 
There were reasons, of course. There are always reasons. Politics, fear, convenience, ambition, love, seeking after glory. Perhaps cowardice too, but a choice was made. And so there are always choices to make and always, always paths not taken. But wherever one finds oneself, one can make a contribution. You do your best, you think of others, you sit and ex set an example. I've made my contributions, I think, in my own way, both to the place I came from and where I live here in Canada. Not in the ways I thought I'd do, but in ways that were possible. So in some ways, life is like a novel with surprise endings. And so here I am, I do my best with what I have, and those other parts that I did not take are far away and in the imagination. I wish you every good luck in your lives. Thank you.